Well, good morning. Let's stand and worship together. Good morning. Welcome to Santa Barbara Community Church. My name is Andy, one of the worship leaders and staff members here, and I'm so glad you could be here and join us in worship. So a show of hands, just who's been really enjoying this study so far in the Holy Spirit? I know that my home group has, has been loving it. We've been having some really meaningful discussions, and we've been really excited to see how the Spirit is moving in our living rooms each week and then coming back and hearing more about it on Sundays. So if you haven't a chance to dive into that study, I encourage you to... Just get into it. It's good stuff. Um, I want to just take a note here and look at the introduction of our current study. I don't know if it was Erin who wrote it. I'm just going to give Erin Patterson credit. I'm not sure if she wrote it, but I'll, I'll give her credit. 
But it's really helped get my head and my heart on track, and I've gone back and read it several times. I wanted to share it with you guys today before we take a moment of silence here. This, it says, over the coming weeks, we're going to dive into the Spirit-inspired Word to examine certain aspects of the Spirit's nature and work. But let's be clear. The goal of this study is not just that we will think rightly about who the Spirit is, as important as that is, but that we might recognize and long for and cooperate more fully with what the Spirit wants to do in and through us. And friends, let's be praying fervent prayers through these weeks that God's Spirit does something new in us, that we would revive and transform us both individually and collectively to the praise of his glory. So let's take a minute just to pray to that Holy Spirit that we've been learning about and inviting him to speak and work here this morning.
Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Santa Barbara Community Church. My name is Ryan Wolfshorndel. I've been a member of this church for about 20 years now, and I help out on our uh, Committee for Local and Global Engagement. And it is my joy and my privilege to invite up a couple partners of our church, uh, Robin Williams and Andre Barkov. Come on up, guys. They're with Hope International. And Santa Barbara Community has been um, partnering with Hope for about eight years now. And there have been some activities that we've gotten to do together and um, opportunities that we've had to get to, to meet different members of Hope. Um, we get to do that again this morning. And so we only have a few minutes, unfortunately. We could talk for a lot longer about some really interesting and exciting things, but we only have a few minutes this morning. Um, so I just have one or two questions for, for each of them uh, to share. Um, first, for Robin, um, for those of you who are not familiar with Hope International, um, what does who is Hope and what does Hope do? What's it about? So at Hope, we actually started 26 years ago in Ukraine. And we were founded by a dairy farmer and a chiropractor who you know, took a missions group over and thought that they were serving the people by sending containers of food and shoes and items for the people. And this is on the heels of them gaining independence from Russia. What they discovered is the pastor came to him and said, you're helping is actually hurting. And rather than some of us going, well, what do you mean? I, we're doing all this for you. They came back and prayed. And that's how hope started. So we started by giving out loans to people because they have the dignity and skills that God has given them to launch their own businesses. And so 26 years ago, we started by handing out 12 loans. And since that time, we have grown over the past 26 years to serve 2.1 million people around the world in 20 plus countries. And so we're all about Christ, capital, and community. We put Christ at the forefront for those who don't know him. It's an opportunity for them to get to know him. And for those who may know him, it's de deepening their relationship with him. It's bringing them together in community and it's providing them the capital so that they can sustain their own families. Great summary, thank you. Um, Andre has been with Hope pretty much since the beginning, one of the longest tenure um, staff people of Hope, uh, which is exciting. Um, he's, he, he is Ukrainian um, also, so he has, <laughs> he has a lot of thoughts and insight as to what's been happening recently. Um, Andre, can you share briefly about what's, What's happened with the Hope clients in Ukraine? And you shared a, uh, a story yesterday with me that I'd like you to share with um, our congregation about uh, the family in Mariupol. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, it's an honor for us to be here. And first of all, thank you for all your support and prayers. So what happened in Ukraine? Well, shortly, the war actually started back in 2014. That was then Russians first annexed. Crimea and the eastern parts of Donetsk and Lugansk regions. But uh, the, the recent escalation that started February 24th uh, last year uh, uh, became really dramatic. And so Hope had around 15 branches all over the country. So then Russians uh, actually uh, invaded well, that strip from annexed Donetsk and Lugansk to Crimea, we lost three our largest branches with roughly 70% of our portfolio, mostly agriculture. So, well, currently those clients are in a terrible situation, in a dire straits. They, are not, they were not able to plant because they don't know there they would sell it. So in other words, around 70% of our portfolio was lost. And <clears throat> so w from day one, hope dove into uh, relief efforts. So we structured our support over like a very uh, 
a clear uh, structure of relief, resilience, and rebuilding. We were in the relief stage there. We would just provide cash grants to churches to provide food and lodging and medication and evacuation from the East, transfer to uh, Europe and beyond. Uh, so that stage was over in July. We switched into resilience there. We uh, restarted landing and supporting savings groups. And I strongly believe after our victory, we will jump right into the rebuilding stage. Well, the family from Mariupol is the brightest illustration of how God moves in Ukraine. So Mariupol is the city that Russians pretty much leveled to the ground. And those guys were hiding uh, in a cellar, in a basement of a local evangelical church. They are non-believers, but they were so touched with how they were treated. They were able to see God's love through those who were hosting them. And, well, the... They had to, you know, exit church for, you know, once in a while eventually to get water, some food. And there was the man's shell and, and one of them who wasn't a believer back then managed to learn Psalm 90 by heart. And she was reciting it, just running away from bullets and shrapnel. In about three weeks, they managed to flee Mariupol and got to, the we to western Ukraine to the city of Ternopil. And they had no doubts where to go. They went to a local evangelical church because they knew that, you know, Christians are different. They, well, they, in their home city, they saw that love. So they got to, to Jesus Christ Church, Ternopil. They were, well, they, they fed there. They provided with lodging. And very shortly, they accepted Jesus and got baptized, all five of them. Uh, mom and dad, their mom who's blind, and two of their kids. And pastor of the church shared that since the explosion of evangelism of 1990s, then Billy Graham would come, Josh McDowell, our mass evangelists, then Ukraine experienced huge revival and growth in church, of church membership. Uh, next 20 years was a plateau. But now we are seeing another revival like church that would baptize one or two per year, last year baptized 23. And those five were in that number. Thank you very much. And one of the things that we love about hope and what connect our church, our church body to hope is this emphasis on local church engagement and ministry through local churches. And that's what hope does. It works through local churches, and so um, we can resonate with their work um, and understand their work very much. So thank you both for sharing. Um, I'll have you guys sit back down, and I'm going to... I'll lead us in a time of prayer. One other, one other comment. Um, early last year, um, our church body gave a special gift towards to hope for work in Ukraine, and so uh, we can take extra joy um, in these stories that we hear that we got to uh, participate in in some way. All right, will you, will you pray with me? Father, Son, and Spirit, we praise you for always being at work. You are at work amidst the devastation and the displacement in Ukraine. You are at work among the, the small savings groups in Zambia and through Hope's loan officers at Urego Bank in Rwanda and in many other ways. And you choose most often uh, to work through your church, uh, your, your little C church bodies that live in community together across the world and your, your big C church, which, which are bound together by love for you and submission to your will. Um, forgive us when we and our little C churches uh, do not act as though we are bound together as the one big C church and are indeed part of the same family which you created through your death and resurrection. Convict us about where we need to forgive one another, 
and ask for forgiveness of, uh, from another. And as for submission to your will, um, quiet our hearts and assure us again of the goodness of your will and that you will sustain us through that which is hard. Remind us that it was out of joy that the man in the parable sold everything he owned to buy that pearl of great price and that field with the treasure buried in it, out of joy. We ask for your continued blessing over the work of Hope International and of Robin and Andre, and bless the work that is done every day by all of its staff and many volunteers. Give lasting health to families and communities through their work. Through its work and our work, we know that you are able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to your power that is at work within us and for your glory. And for our church family here, give us a spirit of grace and sacrifice to our brothers and sisters across the world and also grace and sacrifice to one another and those in our local community that we will become and do what Paul commanded in his uh, letter to the, uh, the Philippians, uh, to, to do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you might become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, let's finish that prayer with our eyes open. Um, Lord, we pray for the message this morning that Mike is going to um, come give to us, that he prepared, um, speak through him. And through our, our ongoing worship, whether in song or all the other activities that we do during today, um, be, be honored and be blessed uh, and bless us. Amen. That was kind of non-traditional, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, Mike, come on up for uh, announcements. I like non-traditional, don't you? Uh, let's, let's go ahead and stand and greet the people around you. Let's make sure everybody feels welcome this morning. Okay, why don't you grab a seat for me, please? <clears throat> just, uh, just one announcement before we get into the word this morning. Uh, the, the, the worship nights that we were having during Lent, um, we heard so many good things about that, and people who are so hungry for that to continue that James is going to keep that going. Um, so we're going to call these uh, upper room nights uh, throughout the series of the Holy Spirit on Monday nights at 7 o'clock. Is that it? 7.30. Thank you. There it is. Boom, right there. 7.30 
uh, over in what we call the upper room or the high school room, we'll be having uh, nights of worship, and they've been fantastic. I want to encourage you to take advantage of that. Well, earlier this week, I was in about roughly the same place giving another message. It was Wednesday morning. I was actually probably right down here, and uh, that group was, it, man, they were enthusiastic, maybe even more enthusiastic than you guys this morning. Uh, it, was a, it was a smaller group of people, and, and by smaller group, I mean both that there was only about 30 or 40 of them filling the first two rows, and smaller meaning they were all about this high. They're all three and four years old. It was for a Trinity preschool that meets here during the week, and uh, our staff rotates through doing chapel for them, and the, the topic and the lesson is actually given to us. They were just saying, do this. And so uh, I got to speak to them on what is the church. And as, as uh, we began, it was my privilege to remind them that, that this building that we're sitting in is not the church. The church is the family of God. It's the people of God. And uh, we talked about how this, this family is, is wonderful and it's quirky. And it's, it's not a family that any of us are born into. It's a family that we're chosen into in love. We're adopted into through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's a lesson that I hope they remember for all their lives. And it's a, a, rem a message that we need to continue to hear and remind ourselves of. Because, well, there's a, there's a gravitational pull in every church towards institutionalism. In every, every church, and I think probably in every age, we always have to fight against this institutionalism that can creep in unawares. And this happens when people begin to think of the church as a, a space or, a, again, an institution, an organization, maybe like the Rotary Club or the Elks Club or any number of these groups that are fine in itself, but that's not what the church is all about. Almost 44 years ago, Santa Barbara Community Church was, was founded as kind of a reaction against that kind of institutionalism. From the very beginning, we've heard often that the church is not so much an organization as it is an organism, a living being. And that's what we, we looked at this week in our, our study of the Holy Spirit. This has everything to do, by the way, with our study of the Holy Spirit as we saw in our home group study this last week, the church is an, a, a people, an organism in whom the Holy Spirit has come to dwell. And that's why we read uh, so regularly in the scriptures that we are a, a temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, those of us who have confessed Christ individually, our bodies are a temple, and collectively as the church, we are a temple of God in whom God's Spirit dwells. And this morning, we want to add to that uh, what we've been looking about, this truths about the Holy Spirit, that God not only comes to dwell in his church, but, but that the Holy Spirit gives gifts to the church. Uh, this is the Spirit who, who gives gifts, and this is an awesome truth that we're going to look at this morning. My sermon, uh, often, often sermons have, you know, three points and a couple of illustrations. I have one point in my sermon today. I hope you can hang on to that. All right. We like simplicity around here, right? And non-traditionalism, too. We like that. Um, why don't you all close your eyes while I give my sermon today? No, no, just kidding. One point in my sermon today. Here it is. Will you say this with me? A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so that we can help each other. So that we can help each other. A spirit spiritual gift is given to each one of us, every person who belongs to Christ, so that we can help each other. That's the New Living Translation uh, in the ESV that we're going to read in a moment. It says, for the common good. So um, if you will, we're going to look a little bit more at that chapter. Will you stand with me to honor the reading of God's word? We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're just going to read several verses here, beginning in verse 1. Paul addresses these Corinthians, and he says this. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. 
So let's pause just right there. and it, See, no one can confess Christ as Lord without the work of the Holy Spirit in them, unveiling the person of Christ. It's important to see. Look at verse 4. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. And to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues or languages. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Have a seat and keep your Bible open. So the first thing I want us to notice about these gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us is, is the variety. It's, variety is a beautiful thing, right? It's the spice of life. And, and the Spirit gives his church a variety, a manifold uh, difference of, of gifts. Um, I love what we see in verses 4 to 6. I don't know if you caught this. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, a variety of uh, service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them in uh, all, in everyone. Now, the, even the way Paul has laid this out is pointing to something. It's pointing to this spirit, the Lord, God, uh, this triune God who exists, one God in three persons, who gives gifts to his community of faith. These gifts, these acts of service, these activities, uh, and, and this is, I want to just say, this is basic Christian theology. Uh, God is not a curmudgeon, a tight-fisted, you know, grumpy old man who just likes to see people suffer. That is not the Christian view of God. We believe in a God who is kind and generous and lavishes gifts on one and all. This should not surprise us. He has placed us in this world filled with beautiful sights and sounds and smells. The God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one who sent his son into the world. Not that we deserved the sacrifice he made, far from it. But out of his kindness and liberality, God did this. And after Christ rose from the dead and ascended to the heavens, he didn't leave us as orphans. He gave us the gift of his presence through the Holy Spirit. This is, this is amazing stuff. But it goes beyond this. And what Paul is getting at here is, is not just the presence, but the Spirit of God equips us, gifts us with, with various kinds of, of, of gifts. Again, uh, all he, God gifts every person in his family things so that we can participate in his family business. This is good news. And so, as it says in verse 7, uh, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, or in the New Living Translation, we say it with me again, a spiritual gift is given to each one of us so that we can help each other, yes. So in response to that, uh, m- many people, their first question is, well, what's my gift? Have you ever thought of that? Like, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, how have I been uh, gifted to, to do this work? It's a, it's a good question. Now, one way of answering that question might be to look at passages like this that list different gifts. Here in, in uh, Corinthians uh, 12, we, we see in verse 8, and following that there's gifts of wisdom and knowledge and faith and healings and, and miracles and prophecy and, and tongues. That's this kind of a worship language, if you will, an interpretation of these tongues. Or we might look at different lists in the Bible. There's, there's other lists of gifts. So in uh, Romans 12, it says this, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, 
then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So there's another list of, of gifts. Um, whether prophesying, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, or showing mercy. We might look at 1 Peter 4.10. Says this, each of you should use whatever gift uh, you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, there's another gift of speaking, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Or we might look. Uh, at 1 Corinthians later on in that chapter. We're not going to get there this morning, but in verses 27 and 28. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, and now he lists different kinds of uh, gifts and ways of serving. First of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues, or again, languages. So as we look at those various gift lists in the scripture, one way to think of what is my gift might be to look at all those lists and compare them and say, it's got to be one of those. But what do you notice about those lists? One thing that I noticed in looking at them this week is that they're not the same. None of them are comprehensive, and they weren't meant to be. Rather, they're simply examples of the kinds of gifts God can give his people, but not limited to those at all. The other thing I notice when I look at those gifts as some of them seem more supernatural than others, don't they? Like gifts of healing and of miracles or speaking in heavenly languages or interpreting them. And some of them seem much more, well, natural, right? Mundane. Uh, they, they seem more like a, a kind of characteristic of someone's natural gift set or personality. What I've found is that those, aren't, those categories of natural and supernatural don't always match what we think they do. I met a man years ago who was on a trip with me, and he had a beautiful singing voice. And I mentioned to him, I said, man, you have such a, a great musical gift and he said, actually, I don't. I'm, I'm not a musician at all. I can't play any instruments. And in fact, before I came to Christ, I could hardly carry a tune. And after I came to Christ, he gave me the gift of song, not even the gift of music. And now I can sing. And so I sing songs to praise the one who gave me this gift. It was a, he would tell you it was a supernatural gift he received at his conversion, the gift of a song. Well, however we understand these things, um, it seems that some of the gifts that God gives his, his church are, are a function of who we already are, things that we have been previously using for other purposes that we now understand and see how to use to bless uh, others and to build up the church. Other gifts are, are given that have little or no connection with our personality, experience, um, but the Spirit gives to all kinds of people all kinds of gifts to do all kinds of his work, and that is good news. So, will you say it with me again? A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so that we can help each other. That's great. Paul goes on to develop this further in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse, let's look at in verse 12. He says, just as the body is one, and as many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. For the body does not consist in one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body and if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, 
where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts and yet one body. Now, do you see that Paul is trying to make a point and just drive it home using absurdity? <laughs> and it's, it's working, I hope. Now, you remember this guy, right? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Potato Head made his debut in 1952, and it was the first toy ever advertised on television. And it's been in distribution ever since. Think of all the toys that have come and gone since 1952, but this one has staying power. Um, when it was first introduced, Mr. Potato Head did not come with the body. It only came with little body parts. And, and there were, they were little push pins that were sent in little packets to kids. And, and what they were supposed to do was just put it into a real potato or a real vegetable of, of one kind or another, I guess. Uh, in any case, uh, they begin to get complaints about rotting vegetables, I guess, and new government safety rev regulations. They begin including the plastic body in the 1960s. But I want to ask, how long do you think this toy, this Mr. Potato Head, would have lasted if they just sent kids a bag of ears and said, have fun, kids? <laughs> or a bag of eyes, that, that wouldn't have worked. The fun is in the variety, is it not? The fun is in the differentness. And the fact that God makes us and gifts us differently and, and shapes us into one body, places us into one body, is what makes the body of Christ so wonderful. We're made differently. I was reminded of how differently we are made and shaped this past week. Benji and I share an office, yeah, if you didn't know, over in the office uh, building wing. And it was uh, Thursday of last week that I, I arrived in the office and I, Benji said, how you doing today? And I said, oh, I, I am having a great day. You see, this is the one morning of the week where I have no early morning appointments. So I had to get up at six o'clock or something. And so I slept in till 8.30 and it was glorious. And he just laughed. He started laughing. He said, oh, man, last night Greta asked me about what my day was going to look like today. And I looked at my calendar, and I noticed this was the one morning I had no morning appointments. And so I was so excited that I could get up at 5.30 in the morning and go for a run and, and read a little bit and get all these things done that I was, you know, had been putting off. Here I am. It was such a great morning because I got to sleep in. And it, for him, he was so excited because he got to get up early. Now, I know some of you are thinking, some of you morning people are like, I knew I liked Benji better. And uh, <laughs> I knew there was something about Mike. What a slacker. Uh, and, but there are another group of people in here who are thinking something very different. You know, there's a bunch of college students in here who are thinking, did he say sleeping in till 8.30? That is not sleeping in. Sleeping in till like 11 o'clock or something. And I just want to say to you, uh, you're right. I'm sorry. I'll do better on that. I'll, I'll work on that. In any case, God both creates us and shapes us differently. And he also gifts us, gifts us differently so that we might together be all that the body of Christ was meant to be and do. Listen, God gives some of us gifts of music and others gifts to engineer things. He's made some of us empathetic and others of us rather matter of fact. He, he's given some of us the ability to speak well and he's given others a great gift for listening. God uh, has, in his grace, given some of us tremendous insight into the Bible and others have great intuition for what is needed at any particular time. This is something we ought to celebrate and recognize in one another and give praise to God for. So will you say it with me again, if I can find it here? Where are we? I gotta back up a little. There we are, here we go, ready? A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so that we can help each other. All right, so the variety of gifts. I wanna, you know, we've already touched on this a little bit about the purpose of these gifts. Now, the, the verse that we've been reciting here, so that we can help each other, or in the, 
uh, English Standard Version, for the common good. That's, that gets more to the purpose of the gifts. But I want us to look through another key passage to concentrate a little bit more on the, the purpose of God gifting uh, his people uh, for works of service. So would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 is uh, this great chapter that we've, again, spent a lot of time on over the years as a church because it's foundational for how we understand our gifting and our roles in the body of Christ. In this passage, you're going to hear a lot of the same terms uh, that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 12, and it's no uh, mistake. You're going to hear the words gift, you're going to hear the word baptism. You're going to hear the word uh, body. You're going to hear the word spirit. And again, Paul is, is talking about how God gifts his people. And here he primarily gets into later on in this chapter and I, that I want us to lean into a little bit, the purpose and the function of these gifts. So let's look at it together, starting in verse 1. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body, again, he's talking about the body of Christ into which we come when we come to Christ, the church. And there is one spirit, just as you are called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Does that verse, verse 7, sound a lot like what we've been reciting over and over to each one is given a gift uh, to help one another? Let me read verse 7 again. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Now, skip down to verse 11 with me. And he, Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood or personhood, to the, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now let's just pause right there and unpack this. The picture we get here of the gifted church is not that there are, are some uber-talented, gifted leaders who preside over the, the less or non-gifted masses in the church. No, not at all. Rather, the leader's job as uh, those who have been gifted by God is to equip the church for works of ministry. Now, many of your Bibles might translate that word ministry as, as service, as acts of service. So again, the leaders are to equip the church for acts of ministry or service so that the whole body of Christ may be built up to reach maturity in Christ. Now, I just want to say for far too often, the church has taken its model from the corporate world. And so we, we get something of this corporate pyramid, right? Where at the top is, you know, the CEO and then the vice presidents and managers and then at the bottom is the, the people uh, of, who work, the employees, so to speak. And the church has kind of just accepted this model too frequently where at the top, you know, is the, the elders or the pastor and then underneath might be small group leaders and then there's the rank and file of the church, the, the laity. And, and there's, there's a dignity that, that is more at the top and it kind of, you know, weans out at the bottom. But that is not the picture that we just got in Ephesians chapter 4, is it? Rather, it, the, the, what we get in the New Testament is this upside-down pyramid where the, the role of the leaders is at the bottom supporting, equipping, developing those in the church, all of the people of God, the laity, the laos, the people of God. This is a, a remarkable term of, of dignity that have been bestowed on us. We are the people of God. 
And the leaders in the church, their job is to equip and support and develop each member of the church to do the work that God has given us to do. So, I love how uh, Eugene P Peterson put it in the message. Listen to his translation of these verses. Christ handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor teacher to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with, with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. Isn't that a beautiful picture of how the church was designed to work? What this means is that if somebody asks you who are the ministers at Santa Barbara Community Church, you should say, we are. We, I am one of the ministers. You are one of the ministers. We are the ministers at Santa Barbara Community Church. We have all been given gifts to do the works of ministry. Now, that does not mean that we are all the pastors at Santa Barbara Community Church. The pastors have been given a role to shepherd and teach and equip the ministers to do their work of ministry. And this is important stuff. Well, what does that mean? That means that, well, whose job is it to disciple our children? It's not our children's pastor's job to do that. It's not up to Paige and Claire and Kim and Rhonda to disciple our kids for us. Rather, their job as pastors is, is to equip us to do this well. And that's what they do. They, they get us who come alongside and say, we want to do children's ministry, and they help us to do that ministry to our children. This means that it's not up to Mandy and Christine and, and Andy and Brian to serve our youth. It's our job as a church to, to help. Uh, th these people are player coaches, if you will. Uh, designed to help equip parents and other youth leaders in the task of serving our youth so that they can be all of who God has made them to be. This, uh, we've talked about this so much over the years. This is what we call every member ministry. If you're a member of Christ's church, if you're a member of the body of Christ, you have a job to do. And you have gifts to do that job. It's a beautiful thing. So it's also been called the priesthood of believers. There is no super spiritual class in the body of Christ. No, the Holy Spirit is at work, not just in a few, but in all of God's people. So, will you say it with me again? A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so that we can help each other. So that we can help each other be all that we intended to be and to give honor and glory to the one who gave us these gifts. Now, lastly, gifts. We need to to uh, revel in the, the multifaceted variety of gifts God gives to his people. And we need to understand the purpose of these gifts. But the most important thing about a gift, a spiritual gift, is to use it. Am I right? Romans 12, 6 says this, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. One of the most amazing gifts that I was given years ago uh, I've been a pastor at our church for almost 20 years now. And just, just after I started, I think I was uh, having a little trouble feeling that I, was, uh, that I should be in the role that I was in. And a group of my friends came around. I think they saw that I needed some encouragement. And they gave me a gift. And I didn't know it was coming. We met every Tuesday night for just encouragement and prayer with one another. And so we met as we always did one night. And uh, once everyone was there... It was like, all right, what are we going to do tonight? And they said, well, we got something a little special. And they brought out uh, a guitar case. And they opened it up and they said, we got you this to encourage you in your ministry. Now, I had, I had a guitar already. It was probably a $100, $200 guitar. Um, but they got me a guitar that was much nicer than one I would have ever gotten myself. It was beautiful. And it was gorgeous, and I, I, I felt overwhelmed by the gift of this guitar. But they would have been disappointed if I would have just taken that gift and hung it on my wall and just thought, man, I can't believe they gave me that gift. That is a beautiful guitar. The first thing they said was, play it. 
We want to hear you play it. And so I picked it up and played it, and I've been playing it ever since. I love that gift. It, it dishonors, though, the giver of the gift if you don't use the gift that you've been given. You know, certainly it was for my enjoyment. I did enjoy it, and they were happy. They were delighted that I did enjoy the gift. But they gave it to me so that I could use it to bless other people. Similarly, with the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives the body of Christ, they were, are given to be used. And I want to ask, do you know that your gift was given to you to be used for the glory of God, for the building up of Christ's church, to make Jesus look good in the world? I love what you guys said about it, how hope uses the gifts of people to do the work of God, to make Christ look great. And what's happening? People are recognizing the glory of Christ and streaming into his church. That's what happens when the church uses the gifts that God has given us. Well, I want to ask you to finish my sermon, if you will, this morning. We've got about five minutes, and I would love to hear many people stand and, and share about how you have seen others in the church family use the gifts that God has given them to exalt Christ, to bless the church. Uh, maybe maybe I, there's, a, there's a woman in my home group who has the gift of baking. And she, when she is on for dessert, more people come to home group. <laughs> we, you cannot poach her. I'm not even going to tell you her name. Uh, but she called me last week and she said, you know, uh, we, the person who does the administrating of our, of our group uh, just had a baby. And so she hasn't been scheduling things out in advance. So nobody's been scheduled for dessert. That was, you know, the gift of the administrator fell off the map. Well, this other woman said, if nobody is scheduled for dessert for the next few weeks, can I just do it every week? I said, oh, my Lord. Thank you, Lord. She's not just doing it to show off her baking skills. She's doing it for the sake of the body, to bless us. And, to, and it's, it is a blessing. So it, it, there's all kinds of different ways in which you may have seen people using their gifts to build up the church and exalt Christ. Can I have several of you just share just 15 seconds or so about how you've seen uh, somebody in this church use their gifts to the glory of Christ? Who will start? Yes. Yeah. Now listen, when we hear something like that, it's awesome that Deanna has that gift, but it goes to the glory of Christ. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Who else? Yeah. Jill Walker has been organizing the library so that we can get good gospel stuff into the hands of young and old. Praise the Lord. Amen? Yeah, what else? What else have you seen? Yeah, and so we say, praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, Dale. That's right. Praise the Lord. Yes, over here.
Another shout out. You, she's in her ninth decade of life and still people are giving thanks for the way she's serving the Lord. Amen. Two more. Yes. Patty. There's Patty. you couldn't hear that. Patty over there, gift of prayer and encouragement and perspective. Last one. Oh, man, we got people. Yeah. I want to speak on behalf of all of you who make music for me on Sunday morning. Uh, I have been blessed by that music for years, and I thank each one of you who participated. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Okay, this is the very last one. Here we go. Well, praise God for that. Um, yeah, let's continue to be the church. And we're going to celebrate now uh, a baptism. As we read, we were baptized into one spirit. And we're going to celebrate now the way that the Holy Spirit has, has changed the life of one young man who has uh, come to see the glory of Christ. And he too has been given gifts. And it's our privilege to come around him and acknowledge the work of God in his life now. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Caleb. I'm the pastor for college and young adults here, and we get the pleasure of participating and witnessing a baptism this morning of uh, one of our dear brothers. So I'm going to let him introduce himself, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to baptize him. Sweet. Thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is Amjad Hawari. I'm, the- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a UCSB student here, so I'm Pretty to know local, and this is my third year. I really fell in love with Christ as soon as I ended my high school year, my senior year, and as I got closer and closer to Christ and fell in love with my faith, I kind of found this journey, and Santa Barbara Community Church really helped with that. Amen. Yeah. Right on. Well, baptism is such a beautiful expression and declaration of the spiritual reality of the believer. That by grace, through faith, we are crucified with Christ, united with him in his death. And as we go into the waters of baptism, we declare that death to our old self. And as we're raised from the waters of baptism, we declare that we have been raised with Christ into his resurrection life. Unified with him both in his death and in his life. Uh, And that's what we get to, to witness today that Amjad is going to declare to you his faith in Christ through baptism. So I have some questions for you. Do you believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth? Do Do you affirm that you are a sinner in the eyes of a holy God? Do. Do you believe that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is for your sin and for your redemption? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do Do you believe in the Holy Spirit as the God who guides you and helps you in your entire life? With God's help, will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? 
putting your whole trust in the grace and love of Jesus Christ, do you desire to be baptized? I do. Amen. Oh, that's so good. And we're going to be getting people wet next week, too. If you have not been baptized since placing your faith in Christ, come talk to us. And if you don't know if you should be baptized, we'd love to talk with you more, give you more information. But now we come to this table that reminds us of the same thing, uh, the sacrifice of Christ for you and for me. This bread represents his body that was given for us on the cross. And the cup represents his blood, which was shed for us that we might be reconciled to the Father. I want you to, those of you who are in Christ, uh, those of you who have tasted of the Spirit, come and receive these gifts for the people of God. Be reminded of his great love for you. And in taking this meal, ask Christ, the, the crucified and risen one, to strengthen you, to use the gifts that he's given you for the work in his family business this week, wherever he might send you. Amen. Sweetest of loves, my heart becomes free. 
stand as we continue to worship. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior.
Church, receive the benediction. This is from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.